Thanks everyone for turning up on a, a cool subway morning. The turnout's been absolutely fabulous. Um, my name's Trevor Lehman. I'm a PhD student at Nirrigilly New, New South Wales. Uh, Nirrigilly's the, um, the Indigenous uh, unit on campus. Um, and I'm also part of the Indigenous Astronomy team. Two of my colleagues are here to actually my supervisor there, Dr. Dwayne Hamaker and, um, and Bob Fuller, who's just recently joined our, our team from uh, Macquarie Uni after finishing a master's over there. If you actually look at the title up there, I've actually changed just a little bit uh, from what was scheduled. Um, I put in the word research in there because, uh, as, as it was mentioned to me a couple of days ago, um, we use Stellarium for a lot of things in our research as well as uh, in the education part of things. So this talk's going to be in two parts, basically. Um, we we'll look at the research part of uh, using Stellarium and the education and how it can be used um, in school curriculums, things like that. Uh, now, what is Stellarium? Anyone actually heard or familiar with uh, the program? This one over there, two, oh, two, three, oh, wow, there's a few, okay. Great, that's good to see. Um, it's an absolutely amazing program. Um, and it's, shall I say, it's a, it's a free to download program. So you're going to rush out now and download on your, on your laptops. There's also a mobile app version. I'll mention a bit more about that one later. But um, the program itself uh, reproduces the night sky accurately. Uh, for any place on Earth, any location on Earth, for any time period within a, a, an accurate range. I've read about 20,000 years plus or minus our current date, so 20,000 years in the past, 20,000 years in the future. It can go beyond those dates, but the errors start to creep in a little bit. Uh, so it's uh, really, really, really useful for our, our research, our work at, uh, at Mirabili. So. I'm hoping this is going to work. I've got a remote, my, my laptops around the corner there, so hopefully, yep, yeah, there we go. So um, the first half of the talk is just how to use Stellarium as a research tool. And I'm going to use an example that uh, was used uh, recently for, we've just got a paper that's uh, in the process of being uh, reviewed, hopefully um, published soon. Um, a lot of my work previous to coming on board uh, at Nirigili was uh, the astronomy around the Uldia region of South Australia uh, using the um, the archive works of Daisy Bates and uh, you see just come up there that's Daisy Bates uh, lived in the uh, in her little tent at Uldia um, from 1919 to 1935 and she recorded a lot of the, uh, the stories of the night sky out there. Um, and if you look at the list there, you see that a lot of the stars are represented by animals, terrestrial animals. And one of the things that we wanted to look at is to see whether there's a connection between the <coughs> stars themselves, um, rising, setting, um, the, what we call the, the aspect, and whether it links in with the breeding cycle of those animals, the life cycles of those animals. So, from that list there, if we just ignore the ones that represent planets, because we, it's hard to sort of look at the seasonal um, variation of planets, uh, but the ones that they link to, to stars, compile a list of those animals, and just have a look at see whether the the stars themselves have a relationship with the 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 life cycle of those animals. So this is um, basically we're developing a methodology here to to explore this. But the question is, um, how are we going to do it? How are we going to assess it? What are we going to look at to see how the uh, the the star relates to those life cycles of those animals? So here we uh, look at six important aspects for these uh, the, the stars. Don't want to dwell on these too much because it's a bit technical. But um, if we look at these, we, we, we look at the 
um, the rising and setting times of uh, each of these stars that relate to the animals and compile a, a list of those relationships. So we look at the um, look at the reliable and uh, rise and set. Uh, anyone want me to define these terms? Are you quite happy for me to just sail through? Okay, we won't ponder on these too much, but just be aware that there are um, some important um, positional uh, relationships that we look at in the stars, and we use that to compare with the uh, three new cycles. So I'll just scroll through these. So we've got the chronicle rise and set, and the meridional crossings of those stars, and there's another little aspect we have to take into account, and that's um, the stellar extinction and magnitude of these stars. And what we mean by that is, um, for those, especially the helical rise and sets, and the chronicle rise and set, you've got to um, wait for the sky to get dark enough to see that star in the sky at the right uh, the right aspect. Um, so what we what we did was we um, we assigned the um, a positional altitude of the sun to be 10 below 10 degrees below the horizon for a first magnitude star. I won't sort of go through these terms too much. Just just be aware that uh, there's a lot of sort of um, uh, things that take into consideration for uh, working out these aspects. Uh, for second magnitude stars, we have the uh, we sun at uh, 14 degrees below the horizon. And uh, for third magnitude stars, so the first magnitude stars are the really, really bright ones that you see in the sky. Second <coughs> ones are a little bit dimmer, the third ones are, uh, are dimmer still, but still quite visible in a, in a good, good night, good clear night. So uh, for the third magnitude, we, we have to have the sun at around about 16 degrees below the horizon before it's, it becomes visible in the twilight at uh, sunrise to sunset. And then we've got to think about as atmospheric extinction we have to take into consideration too. When the star gets very, very low on the horizon, there comes a point where it starts to fade, and it's all to do with the thickness of the atmosphere you're looking at. At the start of the light coming through the atmosphere, it starts to dim the star. So by setting the altitude uh, at five degrees above the horizon, that's the point at which the star is still quite visible before it starts to drift below the horizon and, and fade from view. So we set that at uh, five degrees for our, for our analysis. And it's uh, more particularly relevant to the helical rise set, uh, the chronicle rise and set uh, times. Not so relevant for the meridional crossings because the star is at the, at the meridian. The meridian is a line, if you draw a line between uh, uh, due north and due south, trace a line through the sky, that's the meridian. And when we're looking at meridional crossing, that's the time that the star starts to cross the meridian at a certain time. And we're looking at the uh, at the time around about sunrise and sunset in, in the twilight. Good feedback. Good feedback then. Uh, here's an example. I just thought you know to stay away from here to to illustrate this. Um, here, for instance, we're, we're looking at the star called Arcana, and it's it represents in the Ulian uh, sky. It's the Dingo Mother, and for its heroic rise. And this is using this is how we use stellarium for this purpose. If you look at the, the position of the sun here, we set it at 10 degrees below the horizon. It's going to happen now. It's one of those really bright first degree, first magnitude stars. So we set the sun at, uh, at 10 degrees below the horizon, and we set up and now at five degrees above the horizon. So this is the the position of uh, Arcana just as the sun's coming up in the dawn sky before it gets too too bright and the star gets washed out and also before it starts to extinct um, with the atmosphere thickening just at the bottom here. And what we do is, uh, once we've got this position fixed in, in our Stellarium program, we then look at the, uh, the date and time right here and take note of that time of the year. The time of day, night, time of year. And notice I've got it set 1919, and that's for a good reason. We're looking at the sky from Uldia at the time that Daisy Bates first made those observations. So, again, the usefulness of the program. You can set it to a specific date, a specific location, and get a time of, uh, of these events. 
Uh, in the past, we can also go to the future too, but in this case, with days of eight's work, we said that's uh, time of 1919. So anyway, we record, we record these uh, times. And here's another example. This is what I was trying to explain before with the meridional crossings. So here's the line of the meridian running through. It's going from, uh, from north to south. This is facing south here. <coughs> Arcana, as you can see, is right up here. It's just starting to cross the, the meridian right here where the sun is at 10 degrees. So the sun's rising in the eastern horizon here. And just as the sun reaches uh, 10 degrees below the horizon, we set the, the, the date and time to when Arkana just crosses the meridian, and we take note of that, that date and time. So that's the dawn meridian or crossing time for that star, and that star relates to the Vingo. Mm -hmm. So doing all this analysis, we, uh, we created a, a data set of uh, all the animals from the Uldian night sky, compare the, uh, the life cycles running down here of those animals. So we've got dingo mother, got mating, birthing, whelping, etc. And going through the year, this is the, uh, running through the year from uh, uh, December, sorry, from January all the way to December here, so it's January 1st of December. And look at the, uh, the correlation of that life cycle with how close it matches the position of that star for that, um, that cycle. So in this case, we've got the mating. It's around about the helical rise, right here, and it's shady green because it occurs within two weeks of the astronomical helical rise of that star. And uh, when we do this, this analysis, we find that nearly 50% of those um, stellar aspects occur with the life cycles within two weeks. We go to the next colour in yellow here. About 97% of these is 31 cycles that we've studied in this in this uh, analysis here. 97%, nearly 100%. There's only one that matches within. It's outside the four weeks. It's within six weeks. This one here. So. From that, we can sort of conclude that they are selecting a particular star to represent an animal in the night sky to match the breeding cycle of that animal on the ground. So the, the astronomical calendar is reflecting what is happening on the on the Earth, and it's a it's a um, a resource calendar noting the the life cycles of those animals on the ground. Looking at the star at a certain position in the night sky informs them of what's going to be happening very shortly on the ground. So when they see a certain star rising, um, for instance here, the Calliope rise of Arcana represents a dingo mother, we know that uh, the dingoes are starting to, to breed. Okay. And the same thing with birthing, the helical set of the of the star occurs around about the time that they're starting the birth. And the original dawn crossing is very close to the whelping of those puppies, of the dingoes. And it's the same thing with all of these here in this list. So I was just going to ask you, is this available online anywhere for us? We're actually just about, we're close to actually getting a paper published at the moment. It's just um, it's going through review. Shortly. Yeah, but what academic journal will that be? Uh, we're going to try and send it into the Journal of Astronomical History and Heritage. So that would be, that would be um, that won't have any public access information. Yeah, yeah it's a it's a it's a free online journal. Oh, you is can, it? Yeah, once oh, it's okay. published, sure. you can download it. Download it for free. For it's it's, it's freely available. Yeah. Yeah. Just a question. Sorry. Made a comment regarding the difficulty in doing the research and. Analyzing that against what yep. Aboriginal oral history that's not written down, and how we as people observed it and understood it, and you're using only Basie as the example of Berman. Mm. Have you considered or used the other Indigenous cultures, say like Egyptians or Incan 
ink is in the mod is to to actually map the still area as well. Yep. And be able to make that correlation again. There are other authors there are other authors that are doing similar work overseas yep. with, with other cultures. Um, we're looking at expanding this study to incorporate other language groups in Australia. Um, at the moment, I've only done it for, for the Uldia region, but we are looking at expanding it across the board. But um, there is some evidence to suggest that a similar system is used in other cultures overseas. So, but I don't think any of them have actually sat down and analysed it the same way that we've analysed it here. No, absolutely not. So, yeah, this is a bit more sort of a defined, um, more precise way of looking at it. A lot of the um, work that's been previously uh, published on, the, on, on this area will just say, oh, it, it has been noted that um, the helical rise of the Seven Sisters means that you know, the whales came, come up the east coast of Australia, things like that, but not sort of defined in any particular way. It's more an observation than a uh, tying the astronomical occurrence versus the life cycle of the animal. So, so this is quite quite new at the moment. Um, did Daisy Bates record an indigenous word as well as the English? She word did. Or yes, she did. Um, I did have it in the other previous table. Um, I'll just go back a couple of. Um, Okay, way, way, way back. Doesn't matter. Okay, it, it has been recorded. Yeah, so she did. Yeah. She actually has a local connection. She got. She was a triple bigamist who got married in that. Yes. Like yes. So yes. 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 She's quite legendary in that respect. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah. A bit later on, when I, when I show the um, the, the Stellarium program, I'll show you the constellations in respect to the, the night sky with their um, the indigenous names for those. So, anyway, now another, another um, research um, component of, of Stellarium is it's a way that it can be integrated with other, other programs, and one particular is Horizon. I'm only just getting familiar with this, uh, this process at the moment, but it's going to be uh, quite an important aspect <coughs> of, of our research. Now, Horizon, very much like Stellarium, it's a free to download program. And what it does is it uses um, coordinates and the height, the height, the elevation data from Google Earth to create a rather realistic 3D uh, computer-generated image of the horizon from that location. So again, you can use any location on Earth, uh, plug the coordinates into the horizon, it generates this uh, scenery around the horizon and it's uh, transposable into Stellarium. It will uh, convert the image to a form that Stellarium can recognise in, in its programming. So there's a, a typical um, image of a profile that's generated in the horizon program. And something like that, you can imagine that as a 3D wraparound. That would be the horizon that would generate in that pro program, drop it into still area. And it's useful for us because we can look at the landscape and determine what the sunrise or moonrise, <coughs> sunset, moonset positions, or the rise and set positions of important stars, how they um, appear in the landscape. Are there certain features in the landscape that are used as a, a calendrical marking to determine uh, a certain time of year, for instance, the solstice, the equinoxes, in terms of the sun, and also the movements of the moon along the horizon through its monthly journey and also its yearly journey. So, when it's combined with uh, what we call ground truth and going out into the field, you've created this, um, this horizon profile in, in Stellarium and you've looked at the, the relationships between the, the rising and setting of the certain stars, the sun and the moon, you can then, if something sticks out as, as important to you, you want to go and investigate, then you go into the field and confirm what the program is telling you. So here we've got uh, an image here, it's actually one image with two, uh, uh, two, two other images superimposed, 
of a ridge line between, this is between the Parks and Condobin, and it's called Seven Sisters Ridge. And it's called that because there is a connection between it and the, uh, the Seven Sisters, the Pleiades, in the night sky. So there's a whole dreaming connected uh, with, the, with the Seven Sisters and this ridge here. And what we've, uh, we've done over the last six months or so is go out into the field and observe the sunrise positions at different times of year. This is the December solstice sunrise. There's the equinox sun rising there. And very, very recently, and on a very, very, very cold morning, <laughs> as we all know, the colleagues here, we're all out there. Um, it was minus two one morning and there was plus two the next one. This is the the, the photo I managed to get the, the second morning because the, the first morning was just so foggy you couldn't see the sun. Well, you could see the sun rising through the fog, but you couldn't see the ridge. So there's the June solstice position. So had I, um, had, uh, was, if I was able to, to utilize Horizon, the program to create this here, I could have uh, been able to demonstrate this relationship on the computer before actually going into the field. And uh, it's it's a way of it, double checking, I say ground truthing, but it's also a way of um, determining whether there is a significant uh, relationship or not with the, with the horizon, with the ground. So that's, in, that's another useful part, uh, aspect of the uh, Stellarium program in combination with another program. As I said, it's, a, it's an area that uh, I'm yet to explore it is being used by other cultural astronomers around the world. Uh, and it's a very, very useful uh, program in its own right. So, as an education tool, this is the other half of the talk. Here's a, uh, just a, basically a screen capture image of um, Stellarium. This is just looking straight up into the sky. We've got the horizon um, just around here with the directions indicated. And everything within that circle there is directly above you in the sky. The horizon, everything this side of the horizon, of course, obviously is below the horizon. But I've, I've just illustrated this one just to show you the, uh, the, uh, the full scope of the, the night sky as we see it uh, in the modern Western um, astronomical tradition. And this is the default setting uh, when you open up Stellarium. Not necessarily displayed this way, but it, uh, with, the, with the Western constellations shown. However, there's a really, really interesting feature with, with Stellarium, and that is because it's an open source program, you can upload mm -hmm. other cultures, other Star Wars into the program. Put your own images in it. And uh, this has been done uh, with a couple of um, Aboriginal traditions, cultures. This is the Borong night sky um, admin that was created back in 2006, I think, um, by John Morrison and Alex Journey. Uh, so that's depicting a night sky, an Aboriginal night sky. And more recently, this is the work of uh, Bob Fuller, who's sitting right here. Uh, who's created the Camilleroy night sky. And I'm in the process of doing um, a part of my project uh, into the Wiradjuri night sky. I'll be doing something similar with that. So, because you can upload these, Im oops, these images, um, we thought it'd be a good really useful exercise. Uh, we have this uh, unit that uh, UNSW uh, at C3006, the Astronomy of Indigenous Australians, and for part of the requirements for their assessment, uh, we got the students to design um, packages with add-ins for Stellarium, uh, featuring um, different uh, Aboriginal night skies. One of them was the Waterman night sky from the, uh, the Kaplan region of the Northern Territory based on the work of Bill Harney and Hugh Cairns. So there's just a few pictures of the students working away at their projects here. 
uploading their artworks. There's a couple of examples of their artwork before it was uploaded into, into Stellarium. So basically what they do is they, they do a pen and ink drawing, so it's uh, black ink on white background, scanned, inverted, and there's a bit more involved in that, but uh, basically once it's uh, ready to upload into Stellarium, the end result is something like that. So again, that's just a screen capture of uh, the Waterman night sky, um, based on the works of uh, some of our students from uh, this year's class. So we, we run the class in uh, first semester. And one of the other things that uh, we, we got them to do was to create a study guide as a companion to go with the with the Stellarium package. So um, I'll just pass it around. Just want to have a little look around there. Okay, I'll pass it around. Uh, <clears throat> it was designed as a um, an educational package. Um, it's based on a similar package that was produced by uh, Bob Fuller here for the Camillary Astronomy package, the Stellarium package, which is now currently going out to schools. It's in in the northwest. In the northwest. So. I'll pass these around so I've got a couple of copies, so I'll pass them in this way. So this is just an example of what can be done. I'll pass it back there. Um, in con conjunction with Stellarium, as an educational package. So what is Stellarium? What's it look like? I'm going to try and get this one to work. I've got a digital remote here, so I'm going to just exit from there. Yep, great. Can we get some students to do a Dara or Illawarra thing? Well, that's the whole thing. You know, I'm presenting this as what this is what we've done so far. But uh, down the track, would be uh, good for us to um, do the astronomies from different regions because a lot of the research has been done. Yeah, stories actually, that's probably part of something that Bob could probably be doing because he's totally <laughs> there. This is working. Oh, there we go. Here we go. Okay, that's the default screen setting uh, for Stellarium. When you open up for the first time, you'll see something like that. I've kind of currently got it, as you can see, over in the far left hand corner, bottom corner. I've got it for Sydney. But you can put it in any location into the program. It's going to be a little hard for me to control from here, but I'll just quickly, I'll just try and show you. Moving this mouse around, it's going to be better. Okay, this button here opens up the sky law. So if it's currently set at the western night sky. I won't show you all the features because there's just too many to, oh, I can't even see that on the far corner. This is going to be hitting this. I might have to. I'll just quickly just go into the. I'm going to call up one of the other Star Wars I've been working on. Okay. This is something I was just working on the last week, is um, and it ties in with the start of my presentation. <coughs> this is its uh, debut, and it's still a work in progress. But this is the uh, the night sky of the um, the Uluru region. Oh, again, I'm just going to have to zoom in there again. Now. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about this. There's only got limited functionality. Well, take the microphone in there, and you can stand in there. <laughs> it's just embodied. Yeah, like that's it. right. <laughs> 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 That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. oh, talk from there. Okay. Yeah, talk from there. That's good. I'm just going to start the uh, rotation <laughs> of the night sky, and I'm just going to put up the labels because someone was just um, asking about the, the actual names of the constellations, so the important stars in the Ulu night sky. So I've got the. Uh, the Aboriginal name plus the uh, the actual animal itself. 
in the sky there. This is not, as I said, it's not complete yet. I've got 13 up there at the moment, and there's a good a dozen more to, to be uploaded into it. But it's a, it's a work in progress. It just shows what you can do. And just imagine um, doing something similar for the for the region down here. <coughs> Having uh, this in the Stellarium um, add-in, plus a, a study guide for schools. So it's a great way of getting uh, school kids involved in, in learning the, uh, the Indigenous night skies. What about the moon? Yes, um, we talked about that, didn't we, Bob? There is, a, I think, there is a way of actually putting in the Indigenous names for, for the moons and the planet, the moon and the planets, uh, but we haven't cracked it yet. We're still working on that. So that's a work in progress. And one other thing, when your students are preparing, are they actually using um, like rock carving an indigenous art for some of their art, or are they just making up themselves? Yeah, they can do both actually. Um, it's it's really up to the intent of uh, that particular region. You know, for instance, with my Rotary program, I'm looking at getting a Rotary artist involved to do the constellation art for it, that packet. And I'll leave it up to him to interpret. But what about yes. original art going back thousands of years of, that might exist if something existed or there's not a lot of that around? Um, I'm not sure about that in terms of um, restrictions on, on the artworks. That'll have to be sort of negotiated with communities, I think. Um, this one here, I've, uh, I've cheated in some, some respects because I've just used images of those particular animals. Yeah that are freely available on the net and all I've done is I've, I've just monochromed and inverted the images and uploaded it into, into Stellarium. For instance, the dingo there, that's just an image of a dingo that yeah. was on the net and I've just inverted it and put it up there. So it's very, very flexible in that respect. You can use, as I said, pen and ink drawings or you can use images of actual um, animals and, and other things uh, straight off the net that are freely available and just um, convert the images over for Stellarium to read. So, yeah. Okay, I have a particular question about celestial navigation. Um, uh -huh. uh, because, uh -huh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, go on then. <laughs> uh, I'm, because I'm very interested in the maritime and particularly um, indigenous mm. presence in the maritime, that's really my focus. Mm. Um, and what information, what sort of knowledge do you have about how celestial navigation might have been used? Yes, well, there's one person in the room here who's very, very familiar with that topic. I thought so. <laughs> Bob Fuller here at part of his um, astronomy project. Yes, you were telling me about that actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was, actually, yes. Yeah. It's just that I'm also familiar with, for example, a lot of the other stuff that's going on in the Pacific, such as the star <coughs> canoes in, uh, you know, Hawaii, yeah. Tonga and Tahiti and places well, like that. Uh, and the Marshall Islands, which is very yeah, close yeah, to well, Australia. Um, <laughs> Dr. Uh, Dwayne Hamaker, who's sitting right next to Bob, right here, my supervisor. His, uh, his project at the moment is looking at the Torres Strait Islander astronomy. Yes, yes, and it incorporates a lot of the navigation aspects of it too, okay. and Pacific and Polynesian. Yep. Well, well, my particular reason for asking that was how could this data be used? Like, how could I use this data to look at the possibilities for maritime uh, <coughs> celestial navigation um, in Indigenous Australia? How could I use it for that? Ooh. Because I don't have any raw data, there's no raw data unless mm. I just simply took your data yeah. and then moved it geographically. Moved the, you know, because this obviously, if I just move the latitude and longitude of it, then it will take you to the to, yeah. to um, for example, the eastern coast. Dwayne, might, uh, oh, you might have an answer to that. I, I was just going to say that you, to establish celestial navigation, you know, possibilities. I guess is the word I'd use. Uh, whether it's on land or sea, you really need to know a start place and a destination. Yes. Mm. If you know those, maybe they'd be culturally important yeah. places mm. to start and to finish. Then you could do something like Stellarium to actually look at is there something in the sky that would allow you to navigate to that point. I appreciate that, but the problem is, of course, in any extent. Why don't you go and ask him later? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Probably around. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Oh. As I say, it's not an aspect I've actually delved into much with my project, but it's certainly something to be uh, taken into consideration. Yeah.
Yeah, five minutes. Five minutes. Second off, to go back real quick, uh, just help her around a bit. When it comes to putting artworks in the Stellarium, a lot of what we're doing is reconstruction of astronomical, indigenous astronomical knowledge, which is why we're using this in the first place. Now, in the ASI 3006 course, we had the students take information that is well known, it was all recorded by an elder, you know, intricate detail, and had them pick five artworks. So there's dozens to go from. I just had them pick five. And some of the artworks they used were their own interpretation, but several of them, you'll notice, were actually from art themselves. Because, uh, you know, Bill Hardy, in the book, talks about rock paintings and different types of material culture and how they relate to the sky. So the students actually transpose the image, their own drawings, essentially, of that rock art to stick it in Stellaria. Mm -hmm. Now, having said that, this is not live yet. This has not gone out to anything yet. That project was just something for the students to practice on. They did such an excellent job on this, mm -hmm. and now we're considering making that educational package that will go out to the public, but we have to put more stuff in. And then, of course, we have to go back to Bill Harney and the other elders and make sure they're happy with it. That's right. You know, it's about us going in and doing it. Yeah. Now, uh, Bob here has been doing stuff on Grimilla Roy, and you know, they're, they're already ahead on that. They've got educational packages, and even looking at getting it approved by uh, the State Department of Education. Mm -hmm. So the whole idea here is this is just beginning steps in learning how to reconstruct the indigenous knowledge. And the fact of the matter is we don't know very much at all about navigation here. And that's one of the areas of research that we're trying to explore more. And I say we don't know. We as researchers don't know. I'm sure there are plenty of community members who know lots about it. It's just a matter of as we build up the work and go over time, building those relationships up like I am down with Torres Strait. And I, I spent a month up there. And they were telling me all kinds of things about navigation that had never been recorded. Mm -hmm. So it's just these are baby steps we're taking right now. It takes a long time to, to, as you probably are aware, yeah, to absolutely. work in a community and, mm. and get those things. Yeah, yeah. It's taken over years just to, uh, you know, I think the world you lands on it, mm. just to uh, go into communities and just get myself known more than anything else. Absolutely. People there, they're comfortable enough to start exchanging mm. information. Mm. So, yeah, it takes time. And, and sadly, unfortunately, I, I I do have a copy of that book, uh, Dark Sparklers, by uh, Bill Harney, but I left it in the car, so I might bring it out after lunch, so anyone wants to have a look at it. Okay. Yeah, so. I'm not sure if this goes back to an earlier part or not, I apologise. No, that's fine. Uh, uh, you've got three points for a given star. Uh, the, the time of the year when it's rising mm -hmm. at sunrise, the time of the year when it's overhead at midnight, and the time of the year when it's setting at sunset. Pretty much. Okay, that's yeah. is that right? Um, the original crossing that we're looking at, we're looking at the dawn and the dusk crossing. That's um, just before sunrise and just after sunset. We find that that seems to be an important indicator for a lot of uh, traditions. Well, well, okay, that's what I was going to ask. Yeah. Then. Uh, so, and then the thesis is that for a given uh, animal, let's say a dingo, that mm -hmm. that's had. Um, the Aboriginal name for that star has been the Aboriginal name for dingo. Then you're looking for a correlation between when this, what, what the star with that name is doing in the night sky. And you're yeah. hoping then for a link between the life cycle of, let's say, the, the dingo yeah, that's right. and, and the times of the year that that star is featuring in the night sky because yes. it will change yep. as the year progresses. Mm -hmm. Now, what I'd like to know is have you found a strong correlation? that tells you which of those three points is there consistency? Have you found a correlation for which of those three points links in with the life cycle? So for example, does the early morning rising link in with when the um, species is being procreated or you know, born yeah. or conceived or whatever? Yep. Uh, a lot of that data was in that table there. Yeah, but uh, is there a strong correlation? And well, which, which, which points? Is it the yeah. early morning one, the late one, or the have, midnight one? Yeah, we have two two conflicting um, aspects to look at with, with this work. We can define astronomically an exact time that a star is going to rise or set yeah. or cross the meridian. That's easy to, to determine. We can do that. As you can see, we used to learn it for that as well. Breeding cycles, the breeding cycles and, and, and life cycles of animals, correlating it to stars is, is a little difficult because um, there are seasonal elements to it too. 
you know, you might have a dry year or a wet year and, and the breeding cycle is slightly <coughs> different from year to year. So we look at a window. We look to see whether the star is an indicator of when that life cycle is going to start or is just starting. Yes. And that's as close as, we, that's why I've got the, that table that was broken down into within two weeks, within four weeks, within six weeks. Is there a strong correlation that suggests that the early morning rise ties in with the uh, conception time of those different species? Or, or if, if they're animals, you know? No, it's more to do with um, the appearance of, of that star at a certain aspect, whether it's a helical rise or a helical set, whether it's tied into if the star is in its helical rise, is it just out in breeding and when it's... So you don't know which of those points no, the Aboriginal people are actually thinking it's important mm. to, to assign to that star. Yep. Is, it the, is it when it's setting? Yeah, we're, making, we're making, we're making um, assumptions with certain, certain things and just we're looking at it as a statistical correlation mm. with those six different aspects and see whether they actually occur within any of those six aspects. Um, whether it's like you're saying, you know, the, when it's rising, is that indicating the start of a breeding season, and when it's setting, it's the end? Doesn't necessarily indicate that. It's it's more to do with. So you just basically want that star to feature in the night sky while that species is going through its life cycle and it's very young. Yeah. 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 Okay. Sometimes it's important for it to be in the in the. Um, the sky at night after sunset, sometimes it's important for that star to be uh, visible in the morning sky and before sunrise. How do you know it's important? Um, there's, there's in, in some of the literature, there's anecdotal evidence to suggest that was the important times, but the literature currently doesn't have a, a, um, a statistical approach to it. That well, What we're trying to do here is to define it a bit, a bit more. Yep. I think that to clarify a little bit, we have lots of examples where elders, Islander or Aboriginal, have said, when this star rises at dawn, it means this. Yeah. When this star is high in the sky at dusk, it means that. We have lots of examples. So what we're doing is we've deliberately picked a, a data set, if you will, I hate to put it in such technical terms, um, from the stuff Daisy Bates recorded, because she just said that the stars related to an animal, but she didn't say why. And we know in everything about Aboriginal culture, there's a reason why. So we're trying to use this data set where she didn't clearly indicate that and trying to develop methods to reconstruct that. Now we know that certain stars around different parts of the country relate to this bird laying its eggs or the emu breeding or whatever. We know of lots of hardcore definitive examples. So we're trying to go to these places where whoever's recorded it, a missionary, an anthropologist, Farmer Bob, whoever it happens to be, when they record it, but haven't given those details, we're trying to reconstruct it by using some of these methodologies. And we're just trying to be as rigorous as we can, and that's difficult. But that's kind of what we've done here in this part. So we do know of examples where that's definitive. Yeah, we're trying to, to, to play it here. Rubbery, well. That's why you want strong correlations, right. isn't it? Yes. And that's what I'm asking. Are there strong correlations? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not in isolation. Aboriginal people that look at other issues together with what they're just talking about. Exactly, exactly. There'll be other indicators as well. Yeah. The flowering times of certain plants, all those sort of things, all feed into that indication that the, um, you know, the animal breeding cycles are matching. So what's the name of the journal you're going to publish in? It's JAHH, General Astronomical <laughs> History and Heritage. Sorry. Sorry, Journal of Astronomical. Yeah, history and heritage. We just call it J A H H for short term. Yeah. So. Okay. I'll, I think I've been sharing this today. Other questions? Or? Oh,